Now would you open your Bibles, please, to 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter. Let's be known as the Church of the Open Book. 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, verses 6 through 8. We're going to be thinking this morning on this subject, a religion to die by. A religion to die by. Paul said, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. My dear sir, the real test of your religion will come when the pale horse of death is tied outside your door and death comes and raps with his bony knuckles upon the door of your house. When the death dew appears on your brow, the death gurgle in your throat, then the real test of your religion will come. There are many people who have a religion that's pretty good to live by, but it's not very good to die by. I wonder, do you have the kind of religion that's good to die by? When Paul wrote this passage of Scripture that I've just shared with you this morning, he wrote it from prison. He was in prison and he was waiting to have his head cut off. And even perhaps as his pen was scratching on the paper, outside his window, he could hear the executioner sharpening his lethal axe. And Paul is writing now, and he knows before long he's going to go. And he says, I am now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. And Paul gives a testimony of what deathbed religion ought to be. And do you know Paul, waiting to have his head cut off, had more peace than many of you people right here in this place this morning. That's right. He had more peace and more joy and was less frustrated than many individuals in my congregation this morning. There are three things that this passage of Scripture says to me about the life of the Apostle Paul. Number one, he had a triumphant past. Number two, he had a tranquil present. And number three, he had a thrilling prospect. Now, I want you to notice these things as Paul points them out. In the first place, notice the very triumphant past that he had had. He says in verse 7, I have fought a good fight. He's looking back. You see, when a man's about to die, the panorama of his entire life passes through. And he says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Paul has some precious memory. When some people come to die, their memories are anything but precious. And like a flash of lightning, all of the wicked, ungodly deeds of blasphemy and obscenity and theft, theft and lust and adultery and pride and moral cowardice, these things pass before their mind and they perch on their beds like an unclean bird and croak. And these people say, oh, oh, what a life I've lived, but not with Paul. Paul had such a glorious, such a triumphant past and the precious memories Paul had Paul thought of himself as a spiritual soldier, as a spiritual athlete, and as a spiritual steward. Notice it in this verse. I fought a good fight. He was a spiritual soldier. I have finished my course. He was a spiritual athlete. 
I have kept the faith. He was a spiritual steward. Paul knew that he was a spiritual soldier, and as a spiritual soldier, he knew that he had to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And as old Paul looked back upon his life, I'll tell you, he'd really been through some things. He was stoned and left for dead. He was pickled for 36 hours in the Mediterranean Sea. He was shipwrecked three times. He had uh, so many stripes, 195 stripes laid upon his back. He was let down over the wall in a basket. He fought with lions. He had been in prison. He had a prison record that long, but he'd never been thrown in jail for anything wrong that he'd done, but for preaching the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we were to look at that scarred body, that little stooped figure, that figure that was skinny from fasting and bruised and beaten and wounded, we'd say, Paul, you have been a good soldier of the Lord Jesus Christ. But you compare that with our modern namby-pamby, blow, hot, blow, cold, good Lord, good devil, milk, toast, soda, pop, jelly, uh, hot house Christianity that we have today. I'll tell you the truth. Today people are not interested in crosses. They're interested in cushions, aren't they? And ten drops of rain will keep 40 away. And you just don't have that kind of Christianity today. And people today think they've been called to a frolic rather than a fight. But Paul said we are to endure hardness as good soldiers of Jesus Christ. We're supposed to be in an army. You know how it is in the army. You're there, boot camp, and that top sergeant comes in. And he shakes the covers a little bit. And he says, now, now, open your big blue eyes. It's 7 o'clock. Come on and get up and trickle on down to the mess hall because the, uh, the cook has cooked a real nice breakfast for you. And you know how you did. You turned over and you said, oh, Sarge, I'm sleepy. I think I'm going to stay in this morning. Uh, I was up with the fellas late last night, and besides that, I'm going to see Aunt Susie today. Is that the way you did? No, that's not the way you did. Not when you were in the army. He said, all right, you bunch of buzzards, get up. And you got up. You got up. Now, a lot of us must think we're in something beside an army. But we're in the army. Paul said, I have endured hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. I have fought a good fight. And my dear friend, we're in a war whether you know it or not. Listen, there has been an increase in the last 10 years of 30% in church going. But in the same 10 years, illegitimacy has increased 300%. Smutty literature is a $500 million a year business in so-called Christian America. And venereal disease has increased 72% in one year. And our crime bill is $20 million a year, and crime is increasing four times faster than the population. And for every dollar we spend on churches, we spend $12,000 on crime. For every dollar we spend on churches, we spend $12,000 on crime. Our nation has 7 million alcoholics and 3 and one half million problem drinkers. And if you combine all of the churches and all of the synagogues and all of the temples, they are outnumbered by taverns by 175,000. We're in a war. The Apostle Paul said, I have fought a good fight. He was a spiritual soldier and then he was a spiritual athlete. He said, I have finished my course. He stayed on course. He didn't vary. And his course was an odd course that the Lord had laid out for him as he went on this cross-country run. His course led him through a Philippian jail. But when he was in that Philippian jail, they had revival at midnight, and everybody in jail got saved. And then his course led him through a Roman jail. But when he was in that Roman jail, he won a runaway slave to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then his course led him into Caesar's cell. 
But while he was there, he planted Christians right under Caesar's nose, right in Caesar's household. He formed a church while he was there. Oh, what a man was this Apostle Paul. He had a course, and you just build a jail in front of him, and he'd go right on through it, and he'd come out with the jail gates under one arm and a convert under the other. He loved the Lord Jesus, and he just never varied. He never went around what the Lord would have him do, but he would go right through, and he said, I have finished my course. He didn't stop. Some of you folks used to teach Sunday school. You don't anymore. Some of you used to tithe. You don't anymore. Some of you used to come to prayer meeting. You don't anymore. Some of you used to come to visitation. You don't do it anymore. You quit. Paul said, I finished my course. You can tell the size of a Christian by what it takes to stop him. All hell couldn't stop Paul. Paul knew that if he was going to win the trophy at the end of the race, that he had to keep his eye on the goal and he had to run according to the prescribed course. And God had called this man not only to be a warrior, but to be a soul winner. And by the way, there are only two classes of Christians, soul winners and backsliders. Which are you? That's all, just two. Paul was a spiritual soldier. Paul was a spiritual athlete. And Paul was a spiritual steward because he said, I've fought a good fight. I have finished my course. And then as a spiritual steward... I have kept the faith. Paul believed in the virgin birth. Paul believed in the visible, literal, actual second coming of Jesus Christ. Paul believed in the inspiration of the scriptures. Paul believed in the blood atonement. Paul believed in the great fundamentals of the faith. And Paul could say, I have kept the faith. William Booth who was the founder of the Salvation Army, said that the greatest danger in the 20th century would be Christianity without Christ, religion without the Holy Ghost, forgiveness without repentance, salvation without regeneration, and heaven without hell. And we have a generation of preachers who are preaching all of those things. Paul said, I have kept the faith. He was a spiritual steward, and he was true to the Word of God. Back in the history of England, Latimer, who was England's Christian martyr, was a strong preacher of the Word of God. And one day, Latimer announced that he would preach on a subject that had been forbidden by the king. And as Latimer was about to ascend his pulpit, he looked out and in walked the king and several of his couriers and sat down. Latimer stood there in the pulpit for a while and then he got his Bible and he walked back and forth in the pulpit like this with his Bible. And he said to himself, as though he were musing, but he said it loud enough for everyone to hear, Latimer, Latimer, be careful what thou sayest. The king heareth thee. Latimer, O Latimer, be careful what thou sayest. The king heareth thee. And then he raised his Bible high to heaven and said, Latimer, be careful what thou sayest. Thy God heareth thee. And then he went on to preach the word of God exactly as he had announced his subject. They burned him at the stake. But thank God for a man like Paul. Thank God for a man like Latimer. Thank God for others who can say, I have kept the faith. As the days go on, there's going to become a tendency in the hearts of many of you to fall away from the true church and go to a church that compromises and does not keep the faith. In the last days, things are going to become so hard that Satan will deceive the very elect if possible. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And there's coming a day, as times get harder as we near the end, where there's going to come a great separation. And I wonder which side will you be on? Will you be one of those who will be able to say, I have kept the faith? Paul looked back and Paul had a triumphant past. But not only did he have a triumphant past, 
but he had a tranquil presence. Notice what else the Apostle Paul said. Paul said in verse 6, I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Paul wasn't upset. He was as cool as a cucumber. Paul said, I'm ready to be offered. I know it's time for me to go. What a lesson for you worry warts. You worry about this and worry about that. One time I quoted a lady to a lady, the passage of Scripture over in Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7, which says, be careful for nothing. That means don't worry about anything. Be careful for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. She looked at me and I could tell what she was thinking. She said, yes, young man, it's easy for you to tell me not to worry. Look at you. You're not sick. You don't have any problems. You're young and everything's going fine for you. It's easy for you to say, be careful for nothing. But I reminded her, I didn't say be careful for nothing. Paul was the one, and Paul was in prison when he wrote that, waiting to have his head chopped off. It was Paul who said, be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Do you know why Paul wasn't worried? He knew he wasn't going to die. He said, the time of my departure is at hand. Now, when you depart, that means you're going somewhere. Paul was going somewhere, see. This wasn't the end of Paul. Uh, he was going someplace. Pat and Mike were good friends, and, and Pat died, and Mike came to the funeral and laughed. And they said, well, why are you laughing with your good friend there in the coffin? And he said, well, he said, Mike never did believe in heaven or hell. And he said, there he is all dressed up and no place to go. Well, he had some place to go. He had some place to go. You see, when you leave this world, you go somewhere. Paul said, the time of my departure is at hand. And Paul knew where he was going. That great evangelist D.L. Moody said, one of these days... You're going to read in the newspaper that D.L. Moody is dead. Don't you believe it? I will be more alive than ever before. And let me quote to you the words that old D.L. Moody said when he died. That great preacher of the word of God who, by the way, preached it plainly and clearly and, and boldly and was a believer in the fundamentals of the faith. He said on his deathbed just before he died, Earth is receding. Heaven is descending. God is calling. And I am going home. Is this death? Why, it's not bad. It's glorious. This is my coronation day. Isn't that wonderful? This is the way that old D.L. Moody went out. And the Bible says in Psalm 116, verse 15, Precious in the sight of the Lord, is the death of his saints. And so Paul had a tranquil present. He said, I'm ready to be offered. And I imagine they came and put the key there in the prison door and said, come on, you old narrow-minded Baptist preacher. He said, I'm coming. Just a minute, let me finish breakfast. And so he came out there. There's that great big broad headsman's axe. And that man says, uh, I hate to do this to you. Paul said, no. He said, that's all right. Don't mind. Let me adjust my collar here a little bit. Pulls it down. He said, can you see? Get a good... Sticks his neck. Man says, aren't you afraid? Oh, he says, no. No, I'm not afraid. He said, why not? Oh, he says, I do this all the time. He said, what? Oh, yes. He said, this isn't new for me. He said, you must be a nut. He says, no. I die daily. I die daily. Isn't that what he said? Paul said that in the scripture. He said, I die daily. The first thing Paul would do every morning when he'd get up is die. He died spiritually. That's what I'm talking about. He said, Lord, Paul doesn't matter. You're all that matters. 
and I die daily. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him take up his cross daily. And every morning before Paul ever started out, he had his funeral. That'd be a good idea for you, wouldn't it? Just to say, Lord Jesus, today I'm going to die to myself that I might live unto you. And Paul said, now, just don't feel bad about this. Just help yourself. <laughs> there it is. Oh, yes, Paul said, I'm ready. He didn't mind going. Why, you know, when Paul started out, he was willing to go but wanting to stay. But at the end of his ministry, he was wanting to go and willing to stay. He said, I have a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. But he said, I'm going to stick around for your sake a little bit longer. He said, you need me, and so I'm going to stay around just a little bit longer. Oh, wouldn't it be wonderful, wonderful, wonderful if everybody in the world could die like that knowing that when they close their eyes in this life, they'll open those spiritual eyes in the world to come and look upon the wonderful face of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then not only did he have a triumphant past as a soldier, as an athlete, as a steward, not only did he have a tranquil present when he says, I'm ready to be offered, the time of my departure is at hand, but he had a thrilling prospect. Notice in verse 8, henceforth there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Paul said, I'm going to receive my reward. I'm going for my crown. There's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. I have a thrilling prospect. One of these days, I'm going to see the Lord Jesus. You see, death didn't end it all for the Apostle Paul, and I'll tell you why. A few years before this, Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, came to this earth. And Jesus Christ went out to do battle with the wicked king called death. And Jesus Christ allowed himself to be taken captive by the wicked king. And Jesus Christ allowed himself to be placed in the shackles of death. And death bound Jesus with the iron cords of clamminess. And Jesus Christ for three days was laying in a rock-hewn tomb. It was dark and cold and airtight and a huge stone was rolled in the front of that tomb, and then death clapped its bony hands and shrieked in victory. I've killed him. He's dead. But three days from that time, Jesus Christ stirred himself. He broke the chains that bound him. He reached up on the throne and pulled death down and threw him to the dungeon floor. The crown rolled off of death's head. Jesus Christ put his foot on the neck of death and pulled out his sting. Jesus Christ put the crown upon his own head, took the keys of death, and walked out of the empty tomb. Jesus Christ conquered death. And Jesus said, because I live, ye shall live also. And therefore, the apostle Paul went to a thrilling prospect. And even now, that grand old soldier is in the eternal kingdom. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Every head bowed. Every eye closed. And while heads are bowed, well, eyes are closed. Let me just remind you that you're going to die. There's no doubt about it. You are going to die. And when you die, I wonder, will you have a triumphant past? Will you have a tranquil present? And will you have a thrilling prospect? You can if you know the Lord Jesus Christ. I wonder how many would say while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, Brother Rogers, I'm not a Christian today. According to the true meaning of the word Christian, I have never really been born again. 
I'm not really saved. Jesus Christ has never really come into my heart. I've never really accepted him as my personal Savior and been baptized. Or if I have been baptized, it didn't mean anything because I wasn't really saved. And I need to be saved. And I want to be saved. I wonder how many would say that today. Oh, my dear friend, Jesus will save you today, I'll promise you, if you just trust him. Just trust him. Believe on him. That's what Paul did. One day on the Damascus Road, Paul met Jesus and believed on him. Will you do that? Will you do what Paul did and say, What wilt thou have me to do, Lord? Will you right now say, By the grace of God, when the invitation is given, I'll leave my seat and come forward and accept Jesus Christ as my personal Savior and be saved. And then I'll have a religion not only to live by, I'll have one to die by. And then there are others of you right now who need to move your letters, we've said. Won't you pray about that as we go to the Lord now in prayer? Dear, dear Lord Jesus, I believe there are those here today, many who need to be saved. Help them to understand, dear Father, that Christ died to save them and that he rose to save them, and that he lives to save them, that he will save them, if they will but trust him. And, O oh, Father, those who need to come by transfer of letter, help them to do it today for thy glory, that our church might prosper, and that we might reach souls for thee, dear Lord Jesus. Bless, we pray. Give power during the invitation for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now let me have your attention. Listen to me for a moment. As we stand and sing, if today you will say yes to Jesus, if today you will trust him to save you, I want you to step out from your seat and come forward. There's something about coming forward that settles it and seals it and gives the glory to God. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father which is in heaven. This is your decision. No one can make it for you. But if you'll come this morning, we'll pray with you. And here at the altar, it can be settled. Just tell me, Brother Rogers, I want to be saved. And I'll guarantee you on the authority of this book that I preach from, just as Jesus saved Paul and just as Jesus saved me, Jesus Christ will save you. Now, if you want to move your letter, you step out and say, Brother Rogers, I want to move my letter. I hope we'll be in a spirit of prayer, especially in the balcony. I want us to be quiet and reverent and still. And I want as many of you as will to step out and come on the first stanza, not to do me a favor. I'm just God's messenger boy. Come and obey Jesus and have joy and peace you came in lost and you can leave a child of God if you really sincerely be judgment day honest with him and trust him we're going to sing what hymn 240 turn to it quickly and quietly reverently 240 just as I am without one plea all right may we stand together <laughs>